Thank you for joining us on this episode of Doctor's Diary. My name is Dr. Masi Korir. It is in this show that we bring you some of the stories from the medical professionals and some of the things that push them to achieve more. On this episode, we bring you the story of Dr. Asha Mohammed from Kibra to the helm of one of the most important humanitarian organizations, the Kenya Red Cross Society. These Nubian women quickly changed into their traditional garb, the Gurbaba, and before long they had broken into song and dance. This was a Sunday morning after a night of merrymaking. A daughter here had found a life partner. Gelled seamlessly into this group of women is one of their own daughters, one who had defied all odds to make it to the pinnacle of her career as a doctor. Dr. Asha Mohammed's hut is always in Kibra. It could either be a family events and functions such as weddings and funerals, or simply just keeping in touch with her extended family. My biggest bond, I'll say, is family, and that's why it's, it's so hard to stay away from Kibra. <laughs> so hard. Yes, no, it's so hard. It's really so hard to stay away. Uh, I remember, uh, you know, my now maternal grandma used to even ask us, why did you guys move out of Kibra? Because it's almost like every day you're here. So you might as well have stayed here. Uh, so I think the, the bond is so strong uh, from the immediate family, but also the extended family. So every weekend there are things happening in the community and it's like if you miss, you feel like, you know, I've missed something. I need to be there. Born as a first child, life in Kibra then, as is now among the Nubian community, was communal. The child belonged to everyone in the community and for 13 years of her life, Dr. Asha Mohammed did not know that the woman she called mom was not her biological mother but her grandmother her mother's aunt, who had no children of her own. The way we lived together, and even the way she brought me up, is um, that was never a discussion. And there was nothing that I would say I lacked with her that could have triggered me to think that she wasn't my mother. Uh, even the neighbors would call her Mama Asha. So, I mean, it was obvious then that she must be my mom. After all, it is here in Kibra and in this home that they were born as she started her family with her husband in 1991, 30 years ago. We actually just met here in Kibra. Uh, he comes from the same community and we'll see where he comes from. So in the process of course interacting as young people, uh, that's how we met. But I actually met him through an uncle of mine. They were very good friends. So they would be together most of the time. So of course, uh, getting into contact with my uncle, uh, of course, then that's how we met. <laughs> but this after she narrowly escaped being married off to a Yemeni businessman. I think that was very traumatizing and to date, <laughs> I, keep, I keep thinking about it and every time I hear that, you know, a girl has been married off, you know, these early marriage stories, I, I really feel it. What was, I that, know. what was the circumstance? What was the story around that? You no, know, this was just a businessman who was doing a lot of business in this community and my grandma was a very good customer. She was buying a lot of, of things from him, you know, nice Yemeni uh, clothes and bed sheets and all this. And now, of course, he came home and he saw, uh, there's this young lady here and um, then her, she was like, yeah, yeah, no, she's finishing school in a few years. That was when I was going to do my standard seven. Mm -hmm. And then the trigger really was that now after what gave her even maybe a stronger push was there was a problem in my, in my primary school. Uh, you know, they used to do this shading of the code of the, the secondary school you've selected. Mm -hmm. So I'd wanted to go to Limuru Girls. I don't know what happened, they shaded maybe some of the numbers wrongly and it ended up being actually a Starahe boys code. So I was the best student in my school and everybody got their, call, got their calling letters and I wasn't getting. So even the headmistress was concerned, how come? Then uh, they went to check the ministry and then they realized that actually I had been picked at Starahe. So I would have been actually the first Starahe girls <laughs> at that time. 
Uh, and so now it became an issue because now, so what happens next? And that's when she was like, what happens next? This is maybe God's way of just saying, it's enough. Sun 87 is enough. But uh, my father was the one who was like, no. She can't be the best uh, student in her school and then we say it's enough, she gets married. No, she won't. He asked me, do you want to continue with school? I said, yes. He said, okay, so we'll find a way. So we had to go to the Ministry of Education. We had a neighbor who was working there, so he took us there. We had a lot of follow-up. Finally, then I was given a choice and I was told, um, you can still go to Liberal Girls if you want, or you can go to Nairobi Girls. Then my father jumped and he was like, no, Nairobi Girls, because it's nearer. Uh, we can be checking on her, we can be watching her and, and all that. So that's how I ended up and going to school there. And escaped the, and escaped early, marriage. the early marriage. <laughs> <laughs> She's proud of being a trailblazer, one who has inspired other girls to follow in her footsteps, to excel in their careers, be it in medicine or any other field. As much as we've promoted the girl child, and I'm, I'm very proud of that, we are now also facing another concern. Uh, and that's something we are trying to see what we can do about is that we, 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 we see that the boy child was left behind. And I see that even in the country, because I, when I travel a lot, I, I see that difference. And I always remember uh, once I went to Turkana actually to see one of the projects we are implementing there, and uh, the boys gathered somewhere and I went to talk to them, because it was again uh, a project funded by Global Fund for the girl child, adolescent girls and young women. So we were busy, of course, talking to the girls and trying to find out, you know, what they are going through and how this project had made a difference in their lives. And I just saw a group of boys, you know, congregated under a tree. So I just felt, let me go talk to them. So I went and talked to them, had a conversation, and I asked them, how come you're just congregating around the tree here? And, and then uh, one of them said, Sisi Nindege wa Mungu. You know, it was very touching because it was to say, We've been left. God is the one who should take care of us. And uh, so even as an organization, that's something we are really trying to focus on now to say we need to make that balance. And I see that even more in the community, that we really uh, empowered the girl child, but uh, the boy child has been left behind. And I think if you hear some of the stories in Kibra, you will see that, uh, yes, the, the boys, um, they need support. From the Kenya Red Cross Society, we go to Smile Train Africa. Sada Hassan highlights the story of yet another woman, Dr. Esther Njoroge, who is putting smiles back to the faces of children and adults with a neglected surgical condition that is cleft lip and palate. Very true, Dr. Masi Korir. Indeed, there are people who are channeling their energy and progress to creating a better life for people. One is Dr. Estan Jeroge, the regional director for Smile Train Africa. Every three minutes, a child is born with a cleft lip. As a result, many children end up living with untreated clefts, ending up with difficulties in breathing, eating, hearing, and talking. However, there are people who have channeled their energies and prowess to creating a better environment and life for children born and living with the condition, as well as returning their smile. Smile Train is such an organization led by the regional director. My name is Dr. Esther Njeroge Moreithi. I am a wife and a mother to three. I'm married to Michael Ntere Moreithi and I'm, I'm a mother to an 11-year-old girl, a 6-year-old boy, and a 3-year-old going on 17 boy. I was born in a village in Kiambu called Mushakai and went to Mariaine Primary School on to Loreto Limuru High School in Limuru and studied my undergraduate in medicine at the University of Nairobi, did my public health master's at Moi University, and have done a few other professional development courses at Strathmore University, as well as an accounting course. I'm a certified ACCA. Dr. Njoroge's story tells of possibilities, opportunities, and growth through patience and perseverance. I'm the vice president and regional director for Africa at Smile Train, where I'm responsible for the, our programs in 40 plus countries in Africa. Uh, Smile Train is the world's largest cleft charity. 
and our vision is a world where every person has access to high quality, comprehensive cleft care and is able to live a full and healthy life. While her prowess in her books aligned her to the medical field, chance and luck had a different fate for her. I studied medicine and uh, was destined to become a doctor because that's what I studied. When I finished my medical school, I uh, went on to internship. During my internship, I had an opportunity to meet the then Africa director in a social setting, and he spoke about the organization and the fact that he was looking for volunteers to support the work. And I said, uh, just to step back, I had never come across a child born with cleft before that moment. I had read about it, been taught about it uh, under embryology in school, but had never come across one. And he said he was looking for volunteers, and I said, well, I, will, I have some free time. I could volunteer. And what started out as a volunteer opportunity has turned out to where I am today, 13 years later. Causes of cleft lip and palate are not known, with speculations coming in from it being hereditary to genetics. Many Kenyans are not aware of the condition, or some disregard it. Cleft care is not uh, a priority in many healthcare systems or governments. And so we start off from one, explaining why hospitals should be offering the treatment and then building the capacity for the treatment to be offered and then supporting them to run the program uh, independently. She has met young, talented, optimistic children with desires and hopes to achieve different things someday. Let me talk about one who I met uh, not during surgery, but during their speech therapy or journey. Well, this girl was from Nyeri. And when she came, when she first, she had had her surgery uh, in one of our partner hospitals. And when we started speech therapy services, she was among the first ones that were uh, integrated into the speech therapy treatment. And when I met, when she came into the program, she couldn't express herself because her, the treatment for the cleft palate had been after two years when speech has already uh, developed. And she couldn't express herself. But by the time I was meeting her, we could have a complete conversation. And I remember her uh, picking at my hair and telling me uh, in, in Kikuyu <laughs> that, <laughs> that my hair needs a wash. <laughs> and, and having a, a conversation and a laugh about it. And she was all over talking about my hair, my earrings, my necklace. And, for me, that is the ultimate success of our programs, that a child who could have grown up not being able to express not just such fun things, but their own needs, is now able to actually express themselves and be understood by children around her and grow up not any different from any other child. Indeed, everyone deserves a chance with or without a health condition. Over to you now, Chabet Birir. Thank you, Saada. Up next is the story of Dr. Victor Ngani. He is not only a critical care expert, but also a chess champion and a dedicated family man. Take a look. My name is Dr. Victor Ngani. Um, I work with the RFH Healthcare Group. I wanted to be a doctor in, uh, around when I was in class six. That was in 1991. Um, there was this young man who would come on television and he was super impressive. He was showing parts of the body, the heart, how you know blood would move, and that was quite inspirational. Uh, but then later on in life, I had a change of heart. When I got into uh, high school, I discovered that uh, making things work was a passion I had. Uh, creating circuits, science congress was an eye opener, an amazing opportunity at the school I went to. And I, I love creating things. So I developed a passion for building aeroplanes and uh, rockets and electronic circuitry. And by the time I was leaving high school, I was really making my own uh, circuits with the stuff that I had. But then my father was always visionary in his way of thinking. And uh, he sort of refocused me to what was generally my strength without me knowing. And that's how I ended up in medicine because um, he sort of added me back onto the course that uh, really would have made sense from where I was. And uh, yeah, so that, that's my story for medicine. Mm -hmm. I discovered uh, the area I liked in medicine most 
when I was in internship, um, I discovered that I love critical care, resuscitating people who are at the point of, um, you know, someone whose life is at risk. Um, I'd, I'd find that my contribution made sense. It's very, very different from treating someone who has a small fever, who'd be fine anyway. Uh, that particular role made a lot of sense to me and I, I became good at it. Dr. Ngani, when not busy being a doctor and saving lives, he is a chess champion. In 2018, he represented the country at the World Olympiad and won the championship. This is just one of his several achievements and awards in chess. Winning uh, chess on the national championship, that's the greatest uh, feat I think a chess player can have in this country. And um, yeah, it, it felt amazing, I, surreal to be honest. And um, it, it was quite a privilege to be in that position. Uh, again, in 2019, I participated in the national championship again, and I came third, uh, which was way better than I expected given I hadn't practiced. But again, by God's grace, that is what happened. Um, it, it's one of those achievements that will follow me throughout the rest of my life and it means something. Mm -hmm. And I think very closely next to that is the fact that I've served my country. You know, it seems like I'm going out to play, but when you're wearing national colors, it means something completely different. Despite his busy work schedule, he not only creates time to enjoy a game of chess, he also spends a considerable amount of time with his wife and two daughters. I don't have the most amount of money, but in terms of success, that you'd really struggle to match my success, define the way I've defined it. And this is different from what society defines as success. And in that area of influence, the people I want to start with, um, my family, my daughters, I want to enable them to be the best they can be. For me as a father, my role is to encourage them, to support them, to make them, you know, give them opportunities. He's a very nice person. I'd like to be a bit like him because he has a lot of integrity. He's a very good doctor. He has, he's very, in, he just does things very nicely. When someone is there and when someone is not there, he'll still do the right thing. His advice to the young people is that they should chart their path and the crowd will follow suit. The easiest thing is to flow with the crowd. And I had the chance when I got to university the first time, then we went clubbing and I got into a group we were the only people who were not drinking for example. And it's very popular to do these things because everyone is doing it. But I can tell you this, and Chess teaches you this, that the things that look good in the short term may not be the very best in the long term. Be very careful about the things that you do today that you cannot take back. And so if there's a move that commits you permanently, then perhaps think about it before you make that move. And it may look unpopular and uncool to make take a decision today that strengthens your moral standing, that strengthens your education, that gives you a chance to focus on what really matters. But I guarantee you, five years from today, when you look at the people you'll be looking up to in your own class and your own group, it will be people who have taken this decision. So it's very easy to flow with the crowd. But what you really ought to do is to stand firm, chart your own path, and the crowd will come to you. That is where true strength lies. I had someone once mention, boss, you are not, you're taking a soft drink, boss. I thought it would be tougher than that. <laughs> I'll tell you, toughness is withstanding peer pressure, especially when that peer pressure is kind of daft. It's, it's telling you to do something that's harmful. Being able to withstand that is what real toughness is. Coming up next is the story of Dr. Louis Machogu by my colleague Gloria Milimu. Take it away, Gloria. We talked to the president of Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya, whose passion entails equipping and empowering credible leaders. My name is Gloria Milimu, and this is his story. I am Dr. Louis Machogu. Um, I'm a pharmacist. I like to think of myself as a, as a multicultural Kenyan. Yeah. Why do I say that? I, I was born in Kisi. Um, and I'll, I'll explain why I, I stress on the following. Uh, I was born in Nyaribari uh, uh, Masaba constituency. I grew up in K 
Kisauni constituency in Mombasa County. I also, um, when my parents retired, I also uh, was able to grow up in Kilifi. That's in Twapa, in uh, Kilifi County. I have studied in Eldoret uh, North constituency, uh, in Wasingishu. I have um, studied in um, Vita constituency in Mombasa. I have studied in Dagoreti, both Dagoretis, North and South, in Nairobi County. I've worked in um, Vita constituency in Coast General in Mombasa. I've also worked in um, Samburu. Uh, I will not lie and say that I, I always wanted to be a pharmacist, uh, health, uh, a healthcare worker, um, because I believe you are shaped by the circumstances you grow in. Someone maybe met uh, a, um, a loved one who had cancer, then they wanted to be a healthcare provider. So for me, it was a bit different. Yeah. Um, I grew up in a dairy farm. My dad was a dairy farmer. He retired to be a dairy farmer in Kilifi. So I used to sell milk. Yeah. Uh, my mom, on the other hand, had a salon. So after selling milk, I'll go hang out in the salon. So actually, I, when I finished um, um, my high school, I wanted to become a hairdresser. Yeah. So I, I applied. I got the documents from Pivot College. That was in two, 2000. Um, got the documents from Pivot po uh, College. But when I got home, um, it wasn't able to resonate with my parents. Yeah, so they said, okay, we have bigger dreams for you. Uh, have you ever heard of pharmacy? I never heard of pharmacy. Um, so they brought me the forms, I was able to apply, and I was called to the School of Pharmacy at the University of Nairobi. Initially, I didn't like it, because my passion was in, you know, empowering dairy farmers. Actually, I'd written a business planning competition. Uh, I think those days it was in the business uh, daily, and we were able to become the top 100 uh, uh, people who are, our, our concepts were picked up to, you know, uh, to fund. But uh, at that time I was just told, no, you go, uh, you can be a farmer, a peasant farmer like us, go and get an education, then come back, we see what happens. So yeah, so I ended up uh, in the School of Pharmacy in 2001 and uh, left there in 2005. Yeah. So that's really, um, I ended, it was accidental for me. Um, uh, if I'm honest as well, it was a way of getting a marketable course as well. Yeah. Um, but as I went through the course, I was able to see my gifts and how I can be of use to the, uh, the public. So right now, I've just got re-elected for my second term. So when I came in, the first thing I had to do was trust, build trust. Because you are here, you know, people are so skeptical about leaders, yeah? They think you're going to come and eat their money and things like that. So the first thing I had to do was roll up my sleeves, look at what's the biggest need. At that time, pharmacists were not being employed, and even other healthcare workers, unlike during my time. So I identified young um, pharmacists who were unemployed and had an interest in pharmacy, community pharmacy. So I was able to invest in their pharmacies and... But quickly I realized they don't need money. Yeah, they actually needed to be coached and mentored. So that's when now I started uh, accepting them in like uh, cohorts of 1010 and working with them and having them as peers empower each other and challenge each other. So um, I, I do that as a hobby. Um, I work with them and I think that really helped me. Um, it's on that platform I was elected as the president of the Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya because I found a place where I could serve. And people actually trusted me because of that. I would encourage any young person is segment your life into five, five years. Yeah? Um, look, look for something, a cause that is bigger than you. Yeah? Uh, and leaders are already there. And work with them, serve them, and look for an opportunity to work under them. So the first one I said is get a big goal that is beyond you. Two, you have to, you have to be able to uh, find other people to work with. Your peers who challenge you, and also people who are older. Yeah. And three uh, is you have to start. Yeah. And you start where you are. Yeah. So sometimes we, are, we have so the big goals that you so get paralyzed that you can't move. Yeah. So for me, remember when I, I really wanted to be a hairdresser. That's what I wanted to become because I saw it. That's what I, what I knew. But here I was challenged, go become a pharmacist. So I just decided then, okay, that's what I've been thrown. What, can, what, 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 um, what will I grow in when I go in there? So we started looking at that. So look at, look at places where you can. You can actually go and um, be faithful in those places. 
yeah you have a boss who stresses you see what what can you grow under that boss what can you learn because the, the other day you'll become a boss yeah and now you'll be stressing other people so what can you learn and grow under that and consolidate those years as years of learning and move to the next five years five years like that and you'll be so surprised what you can achieve on doctor's diary we celebrate the heroes and heroines of the health sector join us next time for yet another episode where we highlight the stories of these professionals. My name is Dr. Masi Korir.